Joining me now is Tim Mullen from CUSP in California. Uh, Tim, you gave an interesting keynote, and it was clear from that that you have a, a deep background in, in academia, um, but that's not what you're doing now. Tell us briefly about your background. Right, so my background is in academia. Um, I was previously at the Institute for Neurocomputation at UCSD, as well as with a number of members of my team. And we were focusing really on brain-computer interfaces and on advanced methods for neural state decoding to interpret the signals that come out of our brains and relate them to behavior and cognition. And we created a company, CUSP, to provide tools, APIs really, that allow anybody, anytime, anywhere, to access that powerful neurotechnology that comes out of laboratory environments, but do that with very little expertise, very little domain knowledge, being able to ask something as simple as write one line of code that says, give me your attention state or give me your emotional state, and our system provides that through the cloud. Good. So um, you just said uh, emotional state and attention state. What other kind of states th might I be interested in if I'm an API developer? Uh, if I'm if I want to use your API and develop an app, let's say. Oh, it, it really depends on the application. So let's let's take on one extreme. Um, let's say games. So if you're an entertainment-oriented developer, you might be interested in, for instance, active control, like being able to move or fly a quadcopter around based on you thinking, move left, move right. So we have algorithms that can do that, and I have a bunch of students actually working on that too. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, let's say you're in the digital brain health area, and you might be interested in, say, tracking a particular pathological state, or maybe tracking wellness, or for health and wellness, tracking fatigue states or, or depression. Uh, those are some of the things that, that now research is starting to shed light on the brain mechanisms related to those kinds of states and and you'd be able to to access that information as well very good so what kind of states do you think would be relevant for uh, consumer uh, devices or c consumer applications not to, not the medical ones but the consumer ones yeah I mean I think that it, actually the, what was previously in the medical sphere um, is now becoming more applicable to uh, consumer applications in the area of digital brain health. So if we're looking at, for instance, let's say, just take as one example, autism, um, trying to look at uh, what are the neural correlates of, let's say, a child about to have a meltdown. Um, that would be something that would be very relevant previously in the cl clinical sphere, but now you could imagine an app that just sort of says, oh, meltdown approaching, you know, and then go into a little biofeedback or neurofeedback calm down routine. Um, you could imagine an app around that in the consumer sphere. So this is probably a little bit off topic, but uh, if I made an app like that, wouldn't it need um, to go through FDA approval? It's a some, in some extent it would. It, it really depends on the particular application and what you're claiming. So if it's used as a, as a therapeutic device, for instance, that's actually used to diagnose or, or treat a disorder, then yes, it does have to go through regulatory pathway. And there are, you know, the FDA has been accommodating increasingly the transition from the medical domain into the digital brain health arena and uh, into personalized healthcare and making it easier to have that transitional pathway. So it's not terribly frightening. <laughs> um, I understood in your talk that uh, at the moment it takes quite a long time to calibrate these systems. So regardless of what kind of uh, biosignal that is coming in, in order to, to work out for a particular user um, what different states, uh, what different signals uh, how, how these different signals correspond to different states requires a calibration phase. Um, how long are these phases normally and, and uh, what uh, new developments will help us to reduce these? Well, I think that there it really depends on the individual and on the task. But the amount of time required in terms of the calibration period can range from 5 minutes to 30 minutes and sometimes even longer because it depends again on the complexity of the task and how difficult it is to extract that little neural code, that little signature that's related to the behavior you're looking for, the cognitive state you're looking for. Um, sorry to interrupt, uh, so 30 minutes, I think that's not going to be suitable for any ADHD uh, not necessarily, well, not, no, not today, no, anyway. no, but so, but a lot of work now actually in the neuroscience is about finding generalizable patterns and with big data analytics, so now, you know, we're leading projects for instance with a consortium called the CAN-CTA that's involving carrying out um, experiments across wide, like 20 different experimental paradigms, um, collecting over 3 million different uh, events over uh, hundreds of different sessions from hundreds of individuals and then looking, using sophisticated like deep learning algorithms and other kinds of big data analytic algorithms, trying to find patterns that are specifically related to a state that you can then take a new individual who the model has never been applied to and you've never seen before and immediately have a sort of a good uh, general representation of what the mapping is for that individual that will work right off out of the box with them. I see. So, so rather than the kind of 
for each patient or each uh, consumer a de novo approach uh, to have some a priori knowledge that speeds up this training phase. Exactly. It's all about a priori knowledge and starting with that, that prior information that allows your model to get a good guess of what that person's brain looks like and then it will learn over time exactly what that person's brain uh, looks like and what's the relationship between the brain and the behavior. So you mentioned uh, having access to a lot of data from which collaborative um, Filtering can algorithms, be done. Filtering instance, algorithms yeah, can be done. You can get yeah. statistical inferences uh, based on large amounts of data. Um, uh, this requires having all this data in the in the cloud. And you mentioned something before about uh, your um, Cusp having the, the web API being able to put all this data into the cloud and do the ana analytics there. Exactly. Can you say yeah. a few more words about that? Yeah, so we provide a RESTful API framework. Um, actually, we're, I think, the world's first uh, platform for neurocomputation operating, operating on the cloud through a web API interface in real time. So you can push your biosignals to the cloud through a few API calls. Then we have a large amount of sophisticated signal processing that's spun up to make sense of that data. And then with a few more lines of code through, again, a simple REST API, you can get back a meaningful result and all that happening in real time. Okay. So the reason I put all the data in the cloud is because the computational requirements in processing that data are, are too large to have on, let's say, a uh, mobile device. Absolutely. Today. Uh, can you envisage a time in the future when we, when uh, the, the power, com computational power of mobile phones will be sufficient to do this locally? I can. I can imagine absolutely a time when what we're doing today will have mobile phones powerful enough for processing those signals. But at that same time, we'll have more sophisticated algorithms. So if you follow Moore's law, that exponential curve, well, you see a similar curve for the complexity of the algorithms that are being applied to decode neural states. 20 years ago, you could do a Fourier transform, and that would be the state of the art. Now we could use compressive sensing and sparse Bayesian learning and you know all kinds of interesting and powerful algorithms. In 20 years, yes, we'll have mo more powerful mobile phones, but our algorithms will be incredibly more sophisticated, and there'll be a lot more data that we're crunching, because we'll have sensors that are recording much more activity. So I don't think it's ever going to be the case that you're going to be able to on a mobile, well not ever, I don't want to say ever, but not for a while, that on your mobile phone with the power requirement and the battery requ uh, limitations that a mobile device has, that you'll be able to do the state of the art in terms of biosignal processing and neurocomputation 24-7 on that mobile device. Okay, that's a, a scary proposition to think that every biosignal from us will be one day measured, but if it is, I'd like to know that, that I'm, I'm in control of that data and, and not the NSA. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> no, absolutely. And privacy is, is extremely important, and um, we work with standard bodies around these kinds of issues and trying to identify appropriate standards that can ensure security and privacy and safety. And uh, there's something called the CEREB uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, standards body that is really focused on ethics and privacy as well. Okay, um, so that concludes the, the talking part of the interview. We're going to try a little experiment now. Uh, Tim has, has brought a, uh, a device with him, and he's gonna, we're going to see if this works on camera. Uh, most, most demos uh, work uh, all of the time except when you're doing a, a demo on camera. So. Maybe you can, I'll talk into that. So, okay. um, what this is, this is the Interaxon Muse headset, um, uh, friends of ours up in Toronto. And so if I put this thing on my head, like so, it's now recording my brain activity. And what I'm showing you here, so this is showing, streaming through the cloud, real time, my brain activity. So if I zoom in, I look around, if I blink, 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 we can see the perturbations. Those are blinks there, which are one of the artifacts that actually our algorithms can get rid of. And these signals now are being streamed up through a pipeline that's able to make sense of it. So that if I go to, for instance, this application, this is a little game now, that again, through this web API, and here you go, mm -hmm. um, what it's doing is it's calculating a measure of my attention and how much I'm focusing or concentrating. And I'm playing with a few computer controlled players and trying to steal the orb by focusing my attention on the orb. So you can imagine I might be a child who has, say, you know, ADHD, and you could use a clinically proven or FDA approved algorithm there that's in a biofeedback sense known to enhance your level of focus. And you could play with your parents or your you know, teachers or, or, or therapists and have this very interactive and fun but brain health promoting 
uh, application. And again, this happens through just a few simple API calls, and any developer can build an app like this on our platform. Okay, so this was just one example of, a, of an app that could be built using the web uh, APIs uh, from Cusp. Uh, Tim, thanks very much for taking the time to not only give the keynote, but also speak with us afterwards and give this, give this great demo. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much. Appreciate okay. it. And uh, thanks for watching IEEE CSOC TV.